what for me we have a long journey to take, and uh, might as well get started. Come on in, have a seat, relax. This one's easy peasy, it doesn't require much work. Maybe a little soul searching, but she'd be 100% enjoying that. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful cruise. <laughs> and good night's sleep. Boy, well, it's nice sleep now. Sure. Yeah, I, I know about you. I get a really wonderful uh, night's sleep. My name is Michael Claver, and the initials after my name say that I'm a doctor of medicine. I've been a physician for 46 years now. Is that meant to be an applause line to state an effect? And the building that I hold sacred in my heart is the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago, my alma mater. Oh, no, I'm going to I'm going to Good. <clears throat> fine university, one of the top ten medical schools in the country. You get a fine education there. The next to being a beacon and a husband to my wife, Elise, uh, having graduated from here is one of my proudest achievements. In June of 1972, at McCormick Place in Chicago, I walked across the stage and they handed me a diploma <clears throat> saying that I am now a doctor of medicine. As you can see, I have not changed a bit. <laughs> On that day, I was officially recognized as a doctor. But was I a healer? was the question. I knew how to suture a laceration, I knew how to start a fractured wrist, but was I a healer, really, really, in the deepest, highest sense? Well, 46 years of active medical practice unfurled, and the last eight of them I spent on the medical staff at True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California where we use plant-based nutrition to reverse the most fearsome diseases known to medicine, clogged arteries, high blood pressure, diabetes. And I learned a thing or two about healing. I saw healing up close and personal. And I saw patients like my patient Ken, overweight, obese by 60 pounds on lisinopril and got a prolol for his blood pressure, <clears throat> um, metformin and insulin for his diabetes, uh, his cholesterol and triglycerides were over the moon despite being on status. I watched the power of three months of a whole food plant-based diet run through that body and transform this man into this man. And I've learned a lot about healing. And at True North, we have interns. We have newly graduated chiropractors, naturopaths, family doctors. The, the medical residents, the family practice residents rotate through for a month, three months, six months. And every Tuesday afternoon, we have intern rounds. We present cases, who's in the house, who's, what patients are of concern or, or of interest. And it became evident that these young docs and their third year students, fourth year students, newly graduated, and they have not been out in the world of clinical practice. And they know how to do the basics of their craft, whether it's naturopathic medicine or chiropractic, whatever it is. But they're hungry to learn about healing, really, on its deepest level. And many times our Tuesday afternoon teaching rounds would evolve from beyond treatment of high blood pressure and weaning people off uh, statins 
to the higher and deeper meanings of what it is to be a healer. So I'd like to share with you what I share with the interns as we delve some of the finer and deeper points of being a healer. I'm sure you heard, or I heard it the very first night here, that the word itself is an ancient, ancient one from the old English, Hila. And uh, it means to restore and sound health. Uh, but also it's uh, got to tie in with the word whole, to make whole again, and to restore things to the way they were. And so my young interns and students would ask me, how do you know if you're a healer? How do you know? Got the question. So after much thought, I would ask them some questions. Do you have a deep desire for things to be okay? I knew I was going to be a physician when I was a boy on our farm in Wisconsin. The animals would get hurt or we'd pull a frog out of a snake's mouth and a big gash on his back and we would glue it together and we would uh, add a little sheep with a broken leg and I splinted its leg. I just wanted things to be okay. I still want things to be okay in all my patients, for things to be put right. I would ask them, is easy to suffer for all beings amongst your deepest yearnings? Do you want this whole world to be okay already? If you know that helping others gives the greatest joy, and that it's the true value of our living experience, then you're a healer. It's not getting things, but giving things is really what soothes your heart. If you love to be in nature, if you're comfortable with your own company, and if you're able to become quiet and listen, really listen to others, to yourself, to what life is whispering in your ear, if you can do that, then you're a healer. At least you have the potential to be. And if you know that this is a world of energies, of light and sound and vibrations and psychological spiritual energies, then you know this physical world is not all there is to reality, then you're open to becoming a most powerful healer indeed. And that brings us to the legend of Parsifal. Hmm. Hard to imagine any exploration of healing not enlisting the lessons that come from this ancient legend. From the days of King Arthur, there's a Sir Percival finding its way to King Arthur's court. Percival was orphaned as a child. And he was taken under the wing by his uncle and schooled in the crafts of knighthood. And he was set out to find his way in the world and to seek the Holy Grail. And after many travails and challenges, he duels the Red Knight, he slays dragons, he comes into his manhood. One day, he is on an open plain down near the ocean, and he sees a progression of people, a procession coming towards him. And he looks, and he looks, and he looks, and as the people come closer, it becomes evident all is not well. The people are hunched over, there are, there's no energy in their steps, there, they look ill. There's a darkness about the entire procession. And in the middle of the procession, two of the men are carrying a divan and with a man um, on being carried on this carrier. And Crystal looks at this man, and this man is not healthy either. <clears throat> he has a wound. There's a wound in his groin, some say in his genitals, but there's a wound in his groin. <clears throat> Some verses story there is a sword sticking out of his thigh. This clearly has wounded this man, and this was the king. This is King Amfortus. 
and he's unable to serve the function of his subjects because of this wound. And it's taken his manhood, literally, uh, from him, taken his energy. And the entire kingdom is suffering. And this could be a, a, a metaphor for an individual and their injured heart that keeps them from being their fully manifest person. Parsifal looks and looks and he sees the wounded king and they, the procession stops and they put the king down right in front of him. This is an ancient and well-known story. Richard Wagner, the conductor, uh, the composer, uh, made a whole opera on Parsifal. Some of you may have seen it. I'm going to show you a picture of a scene from the opera of Parsifal that illustrates what I just mentioned. And here's King Amphortus, here's his wound. Here's the people in, in drained disarray because their king is wounded. And here's Parsifal standing there. And Parsifal stands there and stands there and stands there. And he does not know what to do. And uncomfortable moments go by minutes go by. The King M. Fortis is looking at him. He's looking at the king, doesn't know what to do or what to say. <clears throat> Finally, the procession can't wait any longer. They pick up the king and off they go into the sunset. Parsifal feels like an abject failure for a good reason. <clears throat> the king because this is down by the ocean, this is known as the Fisher King. The Fisher King disappears with his people, and Percival is left with his regrets. And he starts to search after the king to make things right. The king cannot be found. And Percival is launched upon this quest that goes on year after year to try and right this wrong. And he's wounded, and he spends nights out in the rain, and he's lonely, and he's haunted by his regrets for not being the man he knew he should be. Finally, after years of travail and about to give up, Percival finds the Fisher King, still with the sword sticking out of his groin. After all these years, Finally, Parsifal goes up to the Fisher King and he asks the question that he should have asked all those years ago. The four words that make everything happen. How can I help? What can I do? That's the healer's question that Parsifal should have asked. And here's this ancient woodcut. Here you see Parsifal pulling the, pulling the sword out of Amphortus' thigh. It's an ancient, ancient act of redemption and right, right, rightfulness and righteousness. How can I help? That is the impulse of the healer. If that wells up on you and you when you see needs in front of you, then you're a healer. And at that moment, on a psychic level, you put on the healer's mantle. Soon as you ask that question, how can I help? What can I do? The impulse to heal is within all of us. If you're, if you're on your front porch and you see an eight-year-old girl on her bicycle and she falls off her bike and she's got a scrape knee and she's crying, that, that part of you that wants to run out there and scoop her up, that's, at that moment, you put on the healer's mantle. It's that softening in your heart to a situation, to a person, to an animal, to a planet. At that point, you become the healer. We can put on the healer's mantle in an instant. It's, quick, it's a, a flick of a mindset. And you become the healer. 
It's really all about love, really. But this is a special instance where your love is particularly needed in a particular moment in a particular form. So the healer asks parts of Paul's questions. <clears throat> How can I help? And then we get down to the essence of what it is to be a healer in a given situation. I tell my students, the healer wants the answer to three questions. You walk into a situation, whether it's a car accident on the side of the road, whether it's a breaking up family, whether it's someone arriving on the gurney with appendicitis, three questions. First, what's the truth of the situation? What's actually happening here? Everything depends upon the truth. This is no place for lies or deceptions. You, the, the healer's got to know what they're looking at. So you, the healer, by definition, is a seeker of truth. Second, what needs to be done? Does that artery need to have some pressure put on it so it stops burning that person's life force on the asphalt? Does the, do you need to call an ambulance? Do you need to get marriage counseling for these people? What, what needs to be done? And the third question the healer asks herself or himself is, what can I do? Not quite the same as the second one. What needs to be done, very importantly, what's my role? What can I do? Am I the guy who puts the hand on the artery? Am I the guy who calls the ambulance on the cell phone? What, what, what can I do? The answer to these three questions form the basis of every healing interaction that you have, including whether you're a mom or, or a preschool teacher or just somebody in line at Starbucks. So, a situation arises in need of healing you got to ask yourself these three questions. What's really going on in here? What needs to be done? What can I do about it? This is a place for selfless action. In Carlos Castaneda's book, the Don Juan Trilogy, Don Juan is teaching his young student, Carlos, uh, the nature of the higher realms. And he says, you want to enter the higher realms Abandon personal history. Doesn't matter. What got you here doesn't matter. What you got going on in your head, your heart, whatever, doesn't matter. If I'm scrubbing for surgery, whether I had a flat tire in my car, doesn't matter. I'm to bring my full attention to this scene to do the best that I can. And no matter how much trauma I have, my money problems, my this problem, it doesn't matter. If I'm a healer in this situation, personal history plays no role here. This is about selfless service. Nice friends, abandoning personal history is such a liberating thing to do. You realize how little one, your own personal melodrama is in the greater scheme of things when someone is laying there bleeding or dying or hurting in front of you. It's a great liberation. If you put yourself aside and focus on what needs to be done, you are a healer. If this becomes your approach to life, if every situation you find yourself in, whether it's driving on the freeway, going to work, looking after your kids, caring for your elderly parents, whatever it might be, or just meeting the people Oh, as you're, as you're going back and forth the meals here, and who comes into your purview? Everyone's in need of healing, a little bit. And it just takes a softening your eyes, a smile, uh, uh, letting them know that, that you, you acknowledge them, you care about them. It's healing in itself. And if relieving healing becomes your greatest joy, then you've assumed the stance of what the, what the Buddhists call the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva is one who's dedicated to relieving suffering wherever she finds it, wherever he finds it. What do you do when I, oh, I, I relieve suffering? <laughs> that's what I do. Well, if there's suffering around, I try and relieve it, and that's the Bodhisattva stance. 
There's no ego about it. It's just what you do. It's just what you do. Everyone can do this. And you start with your, the space immediately around you. How about your, and is the space itself in need of healing? You need to lean up your desk. Does the dog need a walk? Does the, uh, uh, does the floor need sweeping? What can you do to love the space that you're in? And then certainly the beings that are in that space. Uh, does the dog need a bath? Uh, does, uh, have you hugged your kid today? Have, uh, uh, have you dealt with the, uh, have you taken out the garbage? Have you done what you need to do? Everyone's in need of healing. Which brings us around to the idea of the wounded healer. We all have wounds, a lot of gray hairs in this audience. Uh, if you lived on this planet for 20, 30, 40, 50 years or more, you've got your share of wounds, no doubt. And many people can say, don't talk to me about being a healer. Uh, my wife just died. Don't, um, I just got a cancer diagnosis. <clears throat> my son committed suicide. I can't be a healer. Those are real wounds. And nothing that I can say is going to magically make them disappear. Part of being a healer is honoring everyone's wounds. But Rumi said the wound is the place where the light enters you. And often that's just what's needed. I just saw in my cabin uh, the latest edition of um, Good Medicine, Neil, Dr. Neil Barnard's uh, publication from PCRM. Back cover, Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue, physician, who's diagnosed with multiple sclerosis herself, went on a whole food plant-based diet and stopped the progression of her MS. And now she's using her experience to enthusiastically help her patients. She's using her wound as a place where the light comes in. If you've lost a son by suicide, I don't want to be flip and superficial here. There, there's no sealing that wound. But it certainly increases your empathy for someone else who lost their child by suicide. And some of the best counselors, of course, are those who've gone through the very problems themselves. The healer has three concerns. May all be healed, may all be fed, may all be loved. Just and, and to practice when you leave here, everyone who just even for a second flickers across your point of your, your purview. Can you give them a little love in your eyes, in your, in your stance, in, in your being? And those who are tending their own wounds, I would ask, what would help heal you? What do you really need? What do you really need? Let me share with you a healing that I got that I didn't even know I was in need of. And it came from the most unusual quarter. When I was a fourth year medical student, I spent my Saturday nights in the trauma unit of Big Battle Cook County Hospital in Chicago. And I saw the worst of what people do to each other, the shotgun blasts and the machete wounds and the 38 caliber Saturday night specials. And I would leave Sunday morning vibrating with the violence that I had seen. I saw the worst of what humans do to each other, and I vowed at least to get the violence out of my own life. I couldn't just fix the whole world, but I could at least get the violence out of my own life. So I undertook a serious study in my early 30s of living a life of nonviolence. And I read the works by Gandhi and the Indian saints, and I really wanted to become a man of peace. As, as hokey as that might sound, I really wanted to become a man of peace. And so I would live what I thought was a peaceful life. And one evening in Vancouver, when I was an anesthesia resident, I was pontificating to a friend of mine about uh, wanting to get the violence out of my life. 
And with great compassion, he listened to me as I expounded uh, this desire while polishing off a 14-ounce porterhouse steak at the local cave in Cleaver. And he said, that's all very good, Michael. But if you really want to get the violence out of your life, you might want to start with that piece of animal muscle on your plate because in fulfilling your desire for the taste of that flesh in your mouth, you are paying for the death of the animal and for the next one in line at the slaughterhouse. And as soon as he said that, I'd stiffen and all the rationalizations flooded into my mind. Well, that the animal's dead already, and that's what they raised them for, and all the usuals. But before the words could come out of my lips, the little voice in my shoulder said, you know, he's right. He's right. And when I went out to pay for my steak dinner, I felt complicit in a crime when I pulled out that $20 bill. <clears throat> Only cost 20 bucks back then, 1981. And I had grown up on a dairy farm. I knew I went what it took to get meat on the table. I saw the cow shot in the head. I chopped the heads off chickens. I know the cruelty involved in meat production. And after that meal, when I would think about eating meat or later drinking milk, when I realized what the dairy industry really involved, uh, the, uh, the question would arise in my mind, are you really that hungry that you would pay to have the calf taken away from the mother and for to have these animals live this horrible life? And the answer is always, no, oh, not that hungry. And uh, after that, they, 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 this is these animals' lives, and it really matters. Well, I stopped eating animal flesh at that point. <clears throat> Didn't take long before I looked down and saw my leather shoes and leather belt, and I had grown up in a Jewish household after World War II, and I was familiar with the pictures of the lampshades made of the skin of the Jews, and and I looked at my leather wallet and my leather shoes and my leather belt, and they felt cadaverous. They felt ghoulish. And so I went behind my house and I dug a hole and I put my leather shoes and belt and wallet in the hole and filled the hole up and apologized to the animals. And if you don't know, you don't know. But once you know, you know, they say once you look behind the curtain, you can't pretend you don't know what's behind the curtain, you know. And I know where that leather came from, and that was the other best. And uh, the, the era of uh, hemp wallets and, and uh, non-leather shoes began. So I adopted a plant-based diet at that point, because it just felt right. Turned out my body loved it. <laughs> this is 1981. Within 12 weeks, a 20-pound spare tire of fat melted off my waist. My elevated blood pressure went to normal. My elevated cholesterol dropped down 20 points, and I felt great waking up in a nice, lean body. And my head and my heart felt better, knowing that I was no longer supporting those dreadful industries. And I was healed at a level I didn't even know I needed healing yet. It just felt like the animals healed me for not eating them. And, and I get a better night's sleep with a clear conscience. And if any of you need to make this move um, to finally leave the animal feeding and uh, animal usage behind, the rewards will be great, I guarantee you, uh, both on a physical and emotional and spiritual level. It's one thing to be a healer, but how do you do the healing? You have to have reverence for the space that's in front of you with whom you're going to share with the person that needed healing. Because this space is where the healing happens. And the person you're with must feel absolutely safe. It's so easy to pollute this space. It's so easy to damage it with a look, with a shrug, with a reaction, with a statement, with a retort. You're here to heal. You're here to help this being have less pain. Leave your own stuff at the door 
and make this space in front of you safe and sacred for this being who you love enough to give your time uh, so they can get on with their healing. So, this is what I do in my medical practice, is I'm walking down the hall of the clinic to the waiting room to call the next patient. Or if I'm working in a busy urgent care clinic, before I open the door, I'm taking the chart off the door, I know who's there, before I open the door, in a split second, and I'm sharing this with you because with you before you start that conversation with your daughter, before you say something to your mother-in-law, before you close when you close the car door, before you open your mouth and get into a potentially difficult situation. Are you there to create healing or aren't you? If you are, here's some of the stances that can help soften your stance. Um, and, I'll, and I uh, acknowledge uh, Cynthia Hutchinson who, wrote, who put these in lovely form in her book, Healing Touch Meditations. But before I open the door in the clinic, split second, may I see and love this human being in front of me for who she or he really is, not who they think they are. May I know his or her beauty, truth, and goodness or his or her divinity as their true nature. May I be aware of what she or he really needs in this moment and not focus on his past or the future. What do they really need now? May I remain fully present to this person during our time together. Not think about what's for dinner tonight or I should have, I should have mailed in my income tax. You're, if you're there in integrity, and you're there in love, but then you're fully present with this person. May I stay grounded in my body and anchored to this time and space. And may my intention be pure and sacred so that he can flow from what we do here. May this person be empowered to strengthen his or her connection to his higher self through our time together. May I trust that his or her healing will proceed, will unfold with perfect and divine timing. And may I not be attached to any specific outcome for this session, but instead to manifest healing in whatever form and whatever level it's needed, physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual. That's all it meant. Not about me. It's about helping healing happen. And as I said, I, and, uh, I don't go through all the words, but this is how I'm preparing myself before I open that clinic door, before I say anything in the car, before I make that phone call. What is my true motivation and how can I make things better? How can I feel even over the phone? Because when I want the best of the person in need of healing, the best happens. If you're truly sincere, good things happen. Mm. Physicians are told, do no harm. That's exactly the point. If you can't help the patient, at least don't hurt them. Mm. So, how do you help? The most important and most powerful tool you can do is shut up and listen. <laughs> The very act of listening is healing. What is the universal cry of existential pain? No one listens to me. The very act of shutting up and listening says so much in the way of love. <clears throat> Realize that most people will tell you their problems. I had a professor of medicine, you know, people don't get diseases. They earn them. Meal by meal, drink by drink, cigarette by cigarette, argument by argument, they earn their diseases. And that professor said, if you just shut up and listen, 90% of the time your patient is telling you the diagnosis. The patient with the cough, smart, gee, doc, I'm smoking two packs a day, you think I want to cut down? Because if you keep on listening, I'll tell you the truth. 
And the patient with the sore stomach lying in here drinking three or four black coffees a day and two cans of beer. Uh, gee, Don, you think you know, I think I ought to cut down on my coffee and my alcohol? Don't they know? They don't tell you what they need. But it requires you to shut up and listen really to what they're telling you. So once you once you understand what's really going on in their lives, what do you do about it? Another medical professor of mine said, you know, medicine is 10% science and it's 90% common sense, really. People cause their own problems, they can stop their own problems. And it's this point where I tell my medical students about the architecture of the healing encounter. When the person is in front of you in your office, uh, where, no matter where you meet them, Yin is the female receptive state. Yang is the male dominant going out affecting the world state. And if you're going to be an effective healer, you need to be comfortable moving from the farthest pole of yin, which I'll tell you about in a second, to the most masculine pole of yang. Within seconds, within minutes, within an hour, Depends on the pace of the encounter. But there's no question for the physician. You start the encounter by becoming as yin as I possibly can. I want to suck up everything about this person. Who they are, their age, their medications they're on. As they stand up and walk towards me, how are they walking towards me? Are they lift over, do they lift over to one side? Do they limp? Is there pain on their face? How are they dressed? Who are these people? And I want to suck up all this information. And then when I hand them in my office, shut up and listen, tell me what's really going on. What brought you here today? How can I help? And the story comes out. I'm still as yin as possible going through their old lab results, etc. I want to suck up as much information as I can. Now, after I've listened to them and heard them, now it's starting to form, take a form in my head. It's starting to solidify. I got an idea of what's really going on in their lungs and their belly and their legs or whatever. And it starts to get more formed in my concepts and starts moving more toward Yang. Finally, when I know, I know darn well what's going on from the smoking or the drinking or they're eating or whatever, then it's a matter, I shift from me taking in, being very in, to now I'm telling them, you gotta stop smoking, you gotta stop the alcohol, whatever you need to do, you need to take a walk every day, you need to take three deep breaths every hour and clear your lungs out, whatever they need to do. And finally, the most yanky thing is either give them a prescription or pick up a scalpel and open their abscess, you know, actually cut into their flesh. Are you really uncomfortable from the, uh, are, are you, is it sound that, Difficult for you to hear. Uh, are you okay? All right. Playing with her fingers in her ears. Uh, no, I try. Uh, she doesn't want to hear what I'm saying. I think. <laughs> okay, good. <clears throat> so. Too loud. Too loud. Is there nobody in there? Have I been left alone without a sound person to help? It's too loud. Maybe down here. Is that any better? No, it's not. Um, <clears throat> do the best. Okay. So, how can I help? What can I do? <clears throat> you go from yin to yang, and you'd be willing to, to easily shift along this continuum, lingering as long as you need to. If there is disease in front of you, one of two things, and probably both, are happening. <clears throat> There's either a disruption of the form, the architecture, the bone is broken, the arteries obstructed, the, uh, the alcoholic mother is not listening to what their family is saying. There is disruption of form, and there's a blockage of flow, whether it's blood flow, whether it's air in the bronchial tubes, whether it's nerve impulses, whether it's love from the parents to the child, or vice versa, there's a blockage of flow of energy. And almost always there's a lack of understanding and insufficient loving that you can help advance. 
but all disease comes down there's either something that's, that should be whole and it's been broken or something that should be flowing and it's obstructed and it's up to you to find these two areas and help remediate them so envision how things would look when, when i'm looking at either a broken arm lacerated skin or a broken relationship or or a lost soul <clears throat> I envision the most beautiful, I envision that skin back and intact and whole the way it used to be. What would it take? Where would I place my first suture to get things, to get it as beautiful as nature had it? To get their youthful innocence back again. What has to be done for that to happen? And how can I help? <clears throat> so then it becomes, as you do this more and more, as you really get into helping, you realize there's a time to let things happen and a time to make things happen. And wisdom is knowing the difference. Uh, diseases do not just happen. The body is not capricious. It doesn't decide, well, oh, throw up an autoimmune disease today. I'll clog, clog an artery today. I'll inflame my joints today. <clears throat> there's a reason that this happens. And as I said in yesterday's talk, if this young woman consumes a whole food plant-based diet, there's no reason she should ever become obese, have clogged arteries, high blood pressure, diabetes, will not happen uh, with an uh, appropriate diet. So, there is a time when a healer can reach into their bag of tricks and help heal the body. It starts, of course, with the food. If anyone is eating a standard American flesh-based diet, and I know most of you here hopefully are not, I know that with every meal, they are running a toxic brew of saturated fats that make their blood thicker, they clog their insulin receptors, that make them diabetic, that stiffen their arteries, raise their blood pressure, sets off autoimmune diseases, ages their tissues, if they're eating animal flesh, there's a particularly toxic brew from free radicals of the, of the cooked meat uh, to new 5-PC and endotoxin, TMAO and carcinogens and biochemistry pesticides, herbicides. If they are running this toxic brew to their body, meal after meal, day after day, month after month, then that's where you must start. It's the food, it's the food, it's been the food all along. When you got and, and until you do that, nothing's going to get better. You take all the statins and all the anti-inflammatories you want, things are not going to get better. Even if you drive down those cholesterol numbers, disease is still happening until you adopt a whole food plant-based diet. When that happens, the changes are nothing short of spectacular. The obesity melts away, the arteries open up, the high blood pressure comes down, the joints stop hurting, the skin clears up, uh, the uh, bowels return back to normal. People turn into healthy people. Nutrigenomics is the study of how our food turns our genes on and off. And the key to remember here, if you're talking about healing, is you don't need to be a geneticist to understand that the genes are going to be turned on by this fuel mixture and the proteins and enzymes they call for it are going to be much different than the proteins and enzymes created by this fuel mixture with all these phytonutrients bathing your tissues. It's the difference between one and zero, whether you're plant-based or animal-based. It makes such a profound difference. You send this through your tissues meal after meal after meal, people get healthier. Your genes may load the gun, but your diet and your lifestyle pull the trigger. About whether that disease actually manifests depends on what you run through your cells. So instead of pouring this through your tissues with every meal, how about pouring uh, this through your tissues with every meal? Day after day, month after month, this is a hokey analogy, but this river of healing, the water in this river is the water in the fruits and vegetables. And that's what you want washing through your tissues meal after meal after meal. A new healthy body emerges. It's more than just the food, it's the water you drink, how much rest you get, uh, time out in the sun, how much activity you do, who you surround yourself with, what information you let yourself uh, be exposed to. It all runs through you and changes who you are, hopefully for the better, turns people like him into that. 
So, there are tricks in the healer's armamentarium that I share with my medical students at school. And if you, and I'm going to be creating a course on my website on practical healing. And it's how to use heat and cold. Heat dilates blood vessels, cold takes down inflammation, constricts blood vessels. There are times you want to move injured joints to rehabilitate them. There are times you want to keep a fractured bone absolutely quiet. There are times when you apply wet applications to moisturize dry, cracked skin. There are times when the skin is wet and soupy uh, between the toes or under a breast that you want to use powders to dry things out. There are times you want to put pressure on a bleeding artery. There are times you want to decompress a distended abdomen. And there are times you want to get psoriatic skin out in the bright sunshine. There are times the person with the migraine headache wants to be in a dark room. There are times, there are ways to use these physical forces that I will share with you on my website course. And gravity is such a major player as far as elevating a wound when there's too much bleeding uh, to keeping the area dependent uh, to increase blood flow. So the healer, if you want to be a healer, you can learn the basics for how to use these. It makes healing fun and effective. Cleanliness always helps. Change dressings, uh, remove uh, uh, necrotic or contaminated tissue. But the most important thing to prepare is yourself. If you truly make yourself a healer, and you sit down in that sacred space, and you invite people to open their hearts to you, and that's what healing really is, just inviting people to open their hearts to you, and their opening of their heart is what heals them. You're going to hear some jaw-dropping stories. You're going to hear, I was with a Syrian mother who saw her only 12-year-old uh, daughter uh, blown up by a mortar shell right in front of her. There is no removing that horrible image that this woman is going to carry with her all her life. How do you help people like that heal? First, you can not get rattled. Realize that life can hold these things. Humans can do this to each other. In his book, Dune, the author, Frank Herbert, had his young prince, Leto, being schooled by a teacher. And his teacher gave him a very helpful piece of advice that has helped me in some of the bloodiest, most horrible situations. Um, the, the mentor tells Prince Leto, be prepared to appreciate anything you may need. Be prepared, be prepared to appreciate anything you may need. What does that mean? The appreciator is a stance of power. Ooh, look at that. Wow. Yeah, look at that. Bone sticking right out of the skin. Wow, look at that. Wow. Ooh. Boy, the trunk, trunk turned over on its side. Wow, look at that. Start by just, to put, instead of recoiling and judging, whatever, just take it in and appreciate it. Huh, look at that. Look at that. Wow. The fact that you didn't get spooked. You know, you, you don't want the surgeon to lift up the dress and go, oh my God, I don't want to look at that. You know, you, you, know, you want him, no, look at that, look at that. Oh, hmm, you could do something about that. So the stance of the appreciator helps you keep your center as far as being a healer. And in life, boy, you're going to you just turn on the TV. You get lots of opportunities to say, oh, look at that. Wow, you know, I didn't believe they could do that. And the Japanese instruct us in two syllables. I remember the old bad World War II movies and the American soldiers brought him to the Japanese commandant and he said, Ah, so, Yankee, ah, so, ah, so. But stop the film. There is great power in that phrase. Ah, so. Ah, a moment of appreciation. Ah. And then immediate acceptance. So, that's the way it is. Now, then, that's the way it is. Let's start with that. Uh, so, mm -hmm. 
no time is wasted wishing things were somewhere else than what they are. Uh -huh. So, okay, now what do we do from here? Great stand, great power in that stance. And finally, there's the issue of death. Going to be a healer, going to live this life as a healer. Overhanging all of us is the reality that nobody's getting out of here alive. The mortality rate in this room is 100%. <laughs> the question is, what are we going to do with our time between now and our scheduled departure, our inevitable departure? I don't know when it's scheduled, but it's inevitable. That's the key. If you judge the way it's supposed to be, you're going to be unhappy and you're not going to be able to help anyone else heal. And when the mother of six children is run down by a car, you say there's no justice in this world. How can it be? I have no explanation. All I know is that life is so rich, the chance to love is so great and so deep and so rare that I can just agree with the character in Tom Robbins' book, Amanda, and even Cowgirls, no, even uh, another roadside attraction, actually. But Amanda says, when someone says, Sir, what's the meaning of life? She laughs. Said, oh, life has no meaning. It has no meaning, but that's not to say it has no value. Life has no, no meaning to this, but the value is being able to exist on this planet in a, with a body that lets you love and lets you help people and lets you make this a better world and to relieve suffering, which is what the healer does. <laughs> we don't know what each of us has inside of us. <laughs> There's so much healing to be done. Each one of us can be a healer. Each one of us needs to be a healer. <laughs> on a local level, just the people you see at, at lunch today, but on a global level, what we eat determines the future of life on this planet. Every meal makes a difference, especially for the kids whose planet this really is and that we are borrowing. Start healing the person in the mirror, Start doing what you're, you're really eating and what you really need. Ask for help if you need it and see how you can help others. And then extend that love and that healing to every person you meet. Because it's really all about love. And that's really what we're here to do. And everybody knows how to do that. So um, with that, I will invite you, those of you who want to more information, uh, uh, there are some good books, How Can I Help by Ron Bass and Linda Elliott. How can I forgive you? Uh, stay tuned to my website. Um, I'm going to be doing courses on, on practical healing for non-physicians here. Subscribe to my mailing list. So I'll let you know when that's happening. So I feel comfortable that uh, knowing that I'm in the company of so many healers here. And I know everyone wants to be a healer. I know everybody can. So I'll invite you to go forth and uh, do as much healing as you can to everyone around you. Be well. Thank you.